Good afternoon and welcome to the Ideas Festival. Our session for today is As One, How Do You Get a Thousand People to Actually Work Together? My name's Helene George and I'm your facilitator today. I'm the director of a company, a consulting company called Creative Economy and we specialise in development of creative industries, Indigenous economic development and corporate social investment. Um, I'm also recently appointed as a UNESCO expert for the 2005 Convention on Protection and Promotion of Diversity of Cultural Expression. So I think we're very fortunate in Australia and we're very fortunate here in Brisbane to have such a wonderful festival to discuss the ideas and for people to share their opinions and views and it's a wonderful, wonderful forum of the Ideas Festival and a fantastic host venue of the State Library. Today we're very fortunate to have um, in Brisbane a uh, presenter for this session, Murdad Bagai. Murdad is the Managing Director of Alchemy Growth Partners, a boutique advisory and venture firm based in Sydney. Murdad advises large companies on their growth strategies and business building initiatives. He's the co-author of the international bestsellers Alchemy of Growth, and also As One, which we're, is, is New York bestseller, and we're here to discuss that today. Prior to Alchemy Gro Growth Partners, Murdad completed a three-year term with the public sector as an executive for the CSIRO. He's also been a partner with McKinsey's in Toronto and Sydney, and he's also co-leader of an a initiative called High Resolves, which is a community service program around global citizenship and it's reached over 17,000 um, high school students between the ages of 13 and 16 and runs in Sydney, Melbourne and Brisbane. And um, I had the pleasure of uh, meeting Murdad and his, and his partner who runs the project, which I was really, really inspired about as it builds the skills of high school students to actually have the capacity to be change agents of, and social change agents within their own um, ideas and issues and realms and I think it's a wonderful, wonderful initiative that he does alongside his very, very busy practice. So without further ado, I'd like to welcome Murdan to the stage. Thank you so much for the lovely welcome. It's terrific to be here in Brisbane with you and to share with you some of the work uh, that we've been engaged with um, over the last two years. And um, I'm actually incredibly pleased at the reception it's getting. And when we started the work, uh, you know, you, you put, put your heart into it and you think, how many people really want to know about collaboration? And the answer is a lot. Uh, and there, there are many from all walks of life. And what's been interesting is just how varied uh, the interest has been, uh, from principals uh, of schools to people who are running sports franchises to uh, people in the private sector to people in the public sector. And, uh, and all of them are coming at it with this incredible question at, of how do I get 1,000 people to work together, sometimes 10,000 people uh, or even larger. Uh, and um, a lot of times I think that th this is a question that has been treated as something that you know, people with charisma or people with leadership ability can do. And um, it's almost like an art. And in fact, there is some science behind it. And uh, what I'd like to do with you today is just share uh, some of the research and some of the things we found out. Uh, depending on how the time goes, uh, I'll actually uh, be able to show you the results from applying this to the Australian public sector, if you're interested, and how they may want to collaborate with the nonprofit sector. So let me start with uh, the question that kicked this project off. Uh, about three years ago, I was having a conversation with the global CEO of Deloitte uh, a gentleman called Jim Quigley, and uh, Jim's question was, how do I get 170,000 people to work together? How do I get 170,000 people to be on the same page? And that was the question that kicked off all our work. And so let me actually go to the punchline. Um, if you analyze uh, examples of really effective collective behavior, what you find is uh, it actually begins with something that's reasonably obvious, is that you have a cohesive group of people. What do I mean by that? I mean, it's a group of people that actually think of themselves as one group of people. Uh, so what is it that you can do to actually get people to think of themselves as one group? We'll talk about that in a, in a second. The second thing that you notice is uh, that there's some kind of common goal, whether it's a shared idea, a purpose, a value 
set, a calling, but there's something that there's uh, a commitment being made to and that that commitment is shared uh, among those, uh, those large number of people. Uh, and then the third one is something that y you don't think about as much, but it's that those people actually work together productively. It's that they manage to arrive at a common understanding of how it is that they should actually work together. Uh, now, what's interesting about each of these three things is that they're measurable. Uh, and you could create a language and a way of thinking about them. So what I've been really curious about and passionate about is how do you go into situations, uh, whether it's in a, a company or in a, in a government agency or in any kind of community organization, and how do you ask uh, whether they can be more effective at, at the kind of collective activity they want to do, and, and what I try to do is find, we've tried to find a way of measuring whether people see themselves as a cohesive group, whether they've made a commitment to some kind of common idea or goal, and whether they have the same idea about how to work together. And if we can measure that, then you can identify where the weak links are. And as a result, you can make efficient interventions as a leader and try to improve the, the ability of that group to work well together. Everything I'm about to tell you works equally well for a group of 10 people. It works well for a family of three. It works well for a classroom of 25. Uh, but I'll describe it in, in uh, lots of different contexts as we go through. Let me start with this first idea then. Um, when we look at the dimension of whether or not people see themselves as one group, the challenge for a leader is oftentimes how do you get people to feel like they actually belong to a group? Uh, and, uh, and what we typically find when you look at the data is that people feel a sense of belonging uh, most strongly to their immediate group. So the people they're sitting with, the people that they are working most closely with, that tends to be the highest degree of shared identity that you identify. What happens in most organizations and groups is as you zoom out, that sense of belonging or affinity tends to get diluted. And as you keep zooming out, uh, and you get to a large organization, what you effectively see is lots of different tribes and people have allegiances and affinities and a sense of belonging in, to different levels. Uh, what's interesting is you can actually measure in organization how that sense of belonging shifts as the organization gets bigger. So what I have here on the vertical dimension is a higher sense of belonging when uh, an organization might be core to my identity at the top and at the bottom uh, someone may not identify at all with that group. The horizontal axis on the right is my immediate work team, the group that I'm working with the most. And as you go to the left, uh, you're actually looking, going up the hierarchy and looking at the organization more from the top. The common pattern that you see is a line that goes down. People feel like high identity to their immediate work group and that goes down as you go bigger in the organization. There are exceptions. If you were to look at Google or Apple or the BBC, uh, ABC, Many of the people, people who join those organizations actually join those organizations. They have a very high degree of affinity uh, for the organization as a whole. But typically, this is the pattern you see. The other thing that uh, is a real reality is that if you were to look just at the leadership of an organization, the chart on the left shows what happens. Because typically, the leaders have a more flat profile. In other words, the leaders don't naturally understand what it's like for the followers. From their point of view, everyone should have a high degree of affinity for this group. I do. I'm one of the leaders of this group. But what is the reality is as you go down the line in the organization, that affinity is dropping. Um, the other thing that we see is sometimes you see on the right, you see organizations where there's uh, a level that just misfires. For some reason, people in the organization do not identify with a particular part of the structure or group. And when you see that, uh, it gives you some clues as to who are the people who are going to be least likely to be able to motivate a group of people to work as one. So this first dimension to the problem is all about measuring whether or not people have a, a sense of shared identity. And it's the first uh, piece of the puzzle is as a leader, if, you're, if you want a particular group of people to work effectively together, you have to do things to get them to have, a, have that shared identity. And whether that's uh, in some cases using uniforms, chance, secret handshakes, uh, or whether it's uh, all kinds of other devices that are used to create that sense of uh, identity. That's an important first piece. Let me move on to the second uh, piece in, in the puzzle. 
And this is all around the what dimension, or if I wanted to put it in terms of uh, what a leadership challenge is, the question is, do the people that I'm working with actually think they matter? Okay, now, what I'm saying is that if people don't think they matter, then they don't actually do uh, what you're hoping to happen. And one of the biggest issues in leadership is uh, how do you actually convince people that their decision, their action, is gonna make a difference. And what we often find in many of the problems in the world is that we're not talking about 15 people doing something big, we're talking about 1,000 people or 10,000 people doing something small, but you need 10,000 people to do it. Uh, and so how do you get people to decide that they're going to make something happen? And the analogy I wanna give you is a very simple exercise. So imagine that what we're gonna do as a group is lift a very large table, each of us using only two fingers. And if you ever try this in real life, it's, pretty, it's a remarkable thing. You can take 30 people to a very heavy boardroom table and they each walk up with two fingers and they're surprised that they can actually lift this big table. But literally what happens, if I take 30 people, I'll give you the more likely scenario. What will happen is that you get a group of people that I've drawn in green here. Let's call them committed. They show up at the table and they're gonna try to lift that table and that's great. There's a second group of people in light green here we call supportive. These are the people who think it's a great idea for the table to be lifted, and I'm really glad someone came up with that idea. Uh, but, you know, table lifting's not really my game. And so we mistake this uh, for support, you know, this support uh, for something that's going to lead to collective action, and it doesn't. And uh, mixing up these two types of people is actually one of the, the biggest mistakes leaders make. Having a lot of support does not mean that you have a lot of commitment. Uh, there's a third group we call uh, undecided. These are people who understand there's a choice to be made, uh, but I'm just not sure whether you know, enough people are going to lift the table, whether it's going to hurt my back. I'm just going to wait and see what happens, and I might join in. Uh, I might not. Uh, there's a fourth group uh, you typically get. Uh, it's a group we call the unaware. They didn't get the memo, or they're too frantic. Uh, some of them may see people doing things. You can see the, the one person at the back lifting her arms or his arms, and they're sort of sometimes they emulate what's going on, but generally they don't know that a table was to be lifted or, or why. Uh, and then you get the most interesting group in some ways, the opposed, and these are the people who don't think the table should be lifted. Uh, and uh, they may do everything they can for the table not to be lifted. So the leader's dilemma is much more complex when you decide that this uh, table should be lifted, you're not gonna get 30 people showing up, all of whom are ready to roll up their sleeves and lift the table. And part of the challenge for us is uh, if there was a way of shaking up the organization and actually turning it into a nice chart <laughs> so you actually knew exactly how many people were in each camp, it would be a really cool tool for a leader to have. Uh, and the reason is that the pattern's not uh, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%. You get lots of interesting patterns. And let me share with you three of the most common patterns that we get when you actually do this analysis. Uh, so the first one, which is the second chart from uh, the left, is what we call a straddle pattern. And you get a group of people who are committed, and you get a large group of undecided. Now, the exercise for a leader is to see if you can get to a tipping point, to get a critical mass of people who are gonna be committed. And so a leader's challenge here is to convert the undecided. Uh, and we see that in a lot of organizations. You know, the, the supportive people, it's nice to have, they're not gonna really do anything, so you need to convert some of those undecided. The third one from the left is um, actually, a, the best example of it was a bank. And uh, it was, uh, what they were trying to do was develop new products faster. And you can see 70% of that uh, bank's top, um, I think 200, are, are supportive of that goal. How many of you think they're gonna develop new products faster? 70% are supportive, it's a great idea. You can see uh, about 10% are committed. In fact, if you looked at their executive group, there was only one member of the executive group that was committed. Everyone else was supportive. Uh, now, that's a formula for uh, you know, waiting next year and seeing whether any progress has been made. And then the last pattern I share with you, we get variations of this, but you get sometimes the, uh, the leaders just don't realize that the people are unaware of uh, what the goal is. And so there's a communication challenge in getting it out. Um, the point I'm trying to make with this section is that once we have established a sense of identity, one of the things that's important is to know whether or not people have made a commitment to act. Uh, and part of what we try to do 
is get a sense of to what extent there's an in intensity around a direction. You know, to what extent have people made a commitment and translated that strategy or that desire into an individual action? Because in many of the problems we're talking about, it takes the individual action of thousands of people to result in the collective impact we want. So, so far so good. Those two concepts are reasonably straightforward. And we hit the third concept, which is actually quite hard. And the third concept is all around whether or not people have a way of working together that's going to be productive and effective. And um, one way of explaining this is, imagine if I showed you that little diagram. Two circles, three lines. Most common answer in terms of what people see is two trees. But in any given group, if I asked people what they saw, there'd be someone or some group of people who said, I saw two balloons. And some people might see two lollipops. Some people see two face, a face, a happy face. In fact, you get lots of different answers. Now, all we did was took an abstract thing, which is two circles and three lines, and you get all these different answers in terms of what people see. And yet, somehow, we think that if we go out and make a speech and we say, you know, we're going to collaborate on this, or we're going to work as one on this project, that everyone that heard us is going to have the same mental model in their head about what I meant by collaborate or what I meant by work as one. And so what we wanted to do is to say, if you could magically MRI people's brains and say, what picture have they created in their head about how we're supposed to work together, what would you find out? Well, it turns out there's no language for that. We don't have a language for describing people's mental models about leader-follower interaction. We have, we have a preliminary language, but it's not a very uh, good one. So one of the things we tried to do is actually create a language for it. And I'll describe to you the language that we created, but it, it is around eight archetypes that describe leader-follower combinations. And we found that this is a, a much more effective way of trying to understand uh, and, and measure whether people had the same interpretation of how they're supposed to work together. So we can go into an organization and we can actually measure uh, what the mix is. Uh, are there two archetypes that are dominating? Um, some organizations, like the one on the left, have a single way of working together. Some are really mixed up, like the one on the right. Uh, that's an actual organization where seven of the eight archetypes had at least 10% of the population. And these archetypes are very different models of how to work together. So it's amazing they get anything done. So um, what we try to do then is this, in this third sense is measure whether or not there's a common interpretation in people's heads. And I just want to go through the language of this a little bit more and, and share it with you. And the starting point for this um, is actually if you look at the world, you find lots of amazing examples of people working together. You know, I've got some images there. You've got Steve Jobs. Uh, most of you, you know, know the Apple App Store has become a platform for many developers to develop amazing apps. Below it is a photo that uh, many of you may not be familiar with. It's a group called the Dabawalas. And the Dabawalas are lunchtime delivery men in Mumbai. And every day in Mumbai, they deliver about 200,000 lunches. Uh, and yet they're illiterate, largely. Uh, but they have a better on-time arrival rate than UPS or FedEx. Uh, and somehow they manage to pick up these lunches, deliver them to the workplace, and take them back. Uh, and if there's a monsoon or a train is uh, not functioning, they manage to find a way to make it anyway. Uh, or if you look at Cirque du Soleil, how do an amazing collection of artists come up with an incredible show uh, and uh, pull it together in a way that maximizes their skills? Uh, we'll talk about these stories in, as I go through the models, but what we started to do is we started collecting examples of really inspiring ways in which large numbers of people work together. And we said, if you take all these examples, is there some natural way of grouping them? And what occurred to us is that if you look at the way the world sees this today, uh, the best we've managed to do is come up with uh, a binary way of classifying things. And so if you talk to most people, we can distinguish between command and control. That's one way of getting things done and everything else. And everything else, usually in the last 10 years in the literature, is seen as you know, the friendly, collaborative, uh, you know, adaptive way of doing things. And uh, the implication in the literature is that command and control is bad, and everything else is good. Uh, you know, this more community-oriented, networked way of doing things is good. 
So there's two problems with that. The first thing is there's plenty of examples where command and control works just fine. Uh, and it allows large numbers of people to work together. Uh, and I'll share some with you as we go through. The second thing is that uh, it seemed to us that a two pixel view of the world was just not high definition enough. Uh, and when you look at these other examples, there are important nuances and differences that actually play out in important ways. So we needed more granularity in looking at this. And so what we did uh, was um, take a leaf out of uh, advice from my 13-year-old son. There he is um, snorkeling in the Great Barrier Reef. He's a marine biology uh, wannabe. He's absolutely passionate about uh, marine life. He has a conservation program called Blue Promise. He's signing a lot of people up for. But he was explaining to me um, a lot about whales and the taxonomy of whales. Uh, and uh, uh, I began to realize that actually what we were trying to do was create a taxonomy of collaboration. And so with his inspiration, we basically took uh, well over 60 examples of effective collective behavior. And for each one, we took about 63 variables. So how hierarchical were they? Is the leader charismatic? How are people recruited? Is there uh, some kind of orientation boot camp? Uh, is it a, do people work for money? Are they incented because they think they want to make the world a better place? Any variable that you could think of in organization theory, we threw in there. And we used a tool called a self-organizing map, which basically does not place any disproportionate uh, uh, weight on any of those factors. In other words, it's unbiased. It just groups them, and then it tells you what the different types of uh, behavior is. So this is the map that we got. There's no x or y axis. Um, each of the hexagons there represents one of our cases. And what the map is telling you is that the hexagons that are closer together are more alike, and the ones that are in the same color are more alike. And what we tried to do is, in order to make it uh, easier to explain to most people, uh, what we tried to do is shift it to a two-dimensional diagram, a graphic, that people could follow. So essentially, even though I'm going to describe this to you on a two-dimensional plane, there's about 63 variables that were taken into account. And what the book tries to do and our website, everything else, is outlines uh, the six most important characteristics uh, of each of these archetypes. And I'll take you through them. So if you bear with me, let's just go through and, uh, and uh, see what we get. The first thing is that uh, the, the vertical axis in this diagram represents power. It doesn't surprise you probably that um, the way power is exercised was the number one variable uh, distinguishing the modes of behavior that we saw. And as you go towards the top, uh, the leader has the power to essentially set the direction. And as you go towards the bottom, uh, it's the followers that have the sovereignty and the power to decide whether or not they're going to follow. Okay, And that's the first. Uh, variable. And if you look at the first model, which is right at the top of our diagram, it's what we call landlord and tenants. And this is a model where the landlord really sets the tone. They decide what the rules of the game are. And because they've got some kind of economic advantage or power base, they're able to enforce it. So if you want um, Steve Jobs with the Apple App Store, uh, you can tell people what the rules are. You know, We have all these iPhones, iPads, and, and uh, iPods, and you can develop apps for them. Uh, we will market them, we'll handle all the cash, uh, and for that we take 30%, you get 70%. If you're an app developer, you can't negotiate with Apple to make it 72%. It's 70%, that's the term. Uh, and within that, a market forms, and then people can develop apps. And if you develop Angry Birds, you get a check for, I don't know, $400 million, or something like that. Uh, and if you're a developer who developed something that wasn't as popular, you get a check for $10. And, um, and uh, that's the way it works. Now, the tenant has the ability to participate in that ecosystem, in that marketplace, but really it's the landlord that's setting the rules. Uh, if you analyze the way Walmart deals with suppliers, uh, it's the same uh, phenomenon, but it's not just a, a corporate thing. If you look at the Gates Foundation, the Gates Foundation represents such a large percentage of the spend on development research that effectively it's the landlord when it comes to deciding the research agenda and the action agenda for HIV in Africa. And so, you know, as a landlord, you can bring order and you can create uh, a sense of what's going on and the tenants either choose to participate in your endeavor or not. 
So that's the first model. Reasonably clear? Uh, let's go to the exact polar opposite, what we call community organizer and volunteers. So here, the power is in the volunteers. They have to decide whether or not they're going to join. They're, they're highly independent decision makers. They are vocal. They want to express their opinion. And most importantly, they choose to opt in on a case-by-case -case basis. So even if they agree to cooperate today, it doesn't mean that if you ask them tomorrow, they're going to say yes. Every single time, they decide whether or not they're going to join in. What does that mean as a community organizer is you're not going to be able to tell people what the rules are. You're going to have to be able to convince them every single time why they need to join in. And what's the most important tool of a community organizer? A narrative. You need to be able to explain to people why they are important and why they matter and why they need to say yes. Uh, and it helps if your ask is small. You know, you want to ask them to say yes to something small and then ask to something a little bit more, a little bit more. The interesting thing is that community organizers can, over time, develop so much following that no individual matters that much. And at that point, they become a landlord. Uh, but for the most part, community organizers have to bring people on board. If you look at the way Linux was made as an operating system, it was made by an appeal to lots of uh, developers who felt that they needed to be an alternative to Microsoft. And that brings me to one of the most important characteristics. Uh, if you look at community organizer volunteer stories around the world, one of the things you realize is that it is a lot easier to unify people against something than for something. And so the typical tool of a community organizer is to create the big bad wolf. Uh, so, you know, by creating a bad image of Microsoft, it's easier to get people to collaborate on Linux. Or if you look at Egypt, uh, it's a lot easier for people to agree that Mubarak needs to leave the stage. Then try to get the Muslim Brotherhood and the Egyptian military in a room to decide what the future of Egypt should be, not so easy. So part of the task here is, you know, what do you do as a community organizer to create, uh, if you want, unity or commitment when you don't have a negative story? And um, one of the challenges is that you, you, know, you see when in times of disaster, you've experienced one here, uh, this year, uh, communities band together. If you don't have the disaster, if you don't have the bad story, how do you unify people? Much harder to do that around the story of hope. Let me take you to the second dimension, uh, and that's much more around control. So power and control end up being the dominating var variables here. But it's control over what people do day to day. Not so much control over the macro direction, but day to day. What tasks do people engage in? And on the left, uh, people have much less control. They're told what they have to do. On the right, people are given much more autonomy. So let me give you an example. Uh, on the left, we call conductor and orchestra. And the reason we pick this metaphor is because the orchestra has the notes in front of them. You can't just suddenly decide you're going to play different notes. <laughs> you have to play the notes that are on the sheet. And in fact, the conductor is going to tell you how fast or how slow and how passionately. And uh, because the conductor has the sense of the overall picture, you're going to get an amazing piece of music, hopefully. And so this is all about precision in execution. It's all about clarity about the process, training people, and then it's all about incentives, positive and negative, in order to make sure people deliver. And an interesting example is Medco, which is a Fortune 30 company in the US. They have uh, just under 3,000 pharmacists who tend to the medical benefits plans for about 70 million Americans. Now, you're not going to leave these pharmacists to decide on a case-by-case -case basis based on their judgment whether someone should take this drug or that drug, whether they should change the dosage. There are 10,000 rules that have been built up into the system, and the pharmacists have to follow those rules. And the reason is people's lives are at stake. So when you have uh, life security issues or, or you know, precision in execution really matters, you're training people on how to run a nuclear facility. These are the sorts of things that will operate well in conductor orchestra mode, but equally, Starbucks or a coffee shop. Uh, you know, if a barista is being trained how to pour a perfect cup uh, of coffee, there's something about temperature, bands, things like that. There's a lot of training that's involved in those things and parameters. Most fast food organizations are very conductor and orchestra. I should say most successful ones. Um, if you look at the other side of the spectrum, you see something we call producer and creative team. So this is all about autonomy. And here, you're not worried about execution. You're worried about the quality of the innovation, the creativity. 
the amazing ideas that are going to come forward. And so the task for the leader here is assembling the right group of people with a diverse set of talents, skills, and the right chemistry. And you're hoping that they're going to come up with something amazing. And we use the Hollywood metaphor because essentially that's what producers do. You have to bring together the right cast, the, someone who's going to do amazing costumes, lighting, sound. And somehow if you bring all those people together and let them hammer it out and dissent and solve the problems, they're going to produce something remarkable. And this is, a, this is a model we see a lot when you look at companies like Pixar or Cirque du Soleil as an example, when uh, athletes are brought together and turn into artists and over the course of a year they come up with themes for their shows. But you also see it in hedge funds. One of the most successful hedge funds in the world is Bridgewater and it's based on a whole philosophy of dissent and identifying contrarian trends. Um, the important thing here is that people are having intense, frequent interactions and dissent's a really big part of it. Now, just an interesting thing uh, to remember is that organizations can, can work in multiple modes. Cirque du Soleil starts out uh, in uh, creative mode here when they're designing the shows, and when they want to execute the shows, they move into conductor and orchestra. So if you ever go to a Cirque show and someone manages to slip on a high wire in the middle of an act, that is a slip that is intentional and it happens at exactly the same moment every night. And so they go from a highly creative process in designing the show to a highly uh, execution-oriented uh, archetype when it comes to actually uh, running the show every night. So those are the four core archetypes we came up with. We also had uh, four hybrids. I'm just going to go through those very quickly. General and Soldiers is a hybrid, uh, which is around the, the traditional command and control model. It's a top-down strategy and direction, but it's translated into the specific tasks that people do. One of the things that's really important for this model is hierarchy, not because just the chain of command reasons, uh, but hier hierarchy is important for motivating people to stay, because you always want to move to the next level. If you look at what happens with kids with video games, uh, if there's something magical at 10,000 points, the kids won't put the video game down from 8,000 to 10,000, and then they take a break. Same thing around the idea. If you have lots of hierarchical levels, you're motivating people to keep trying. We call architect and builders um, a really important archetype that we're seeing more and more in society. This is when the leader has an amazing vision, almost unattainable vision of what they want to build, but you need the creative input of lots of different people to make it happen. So a top-down direction, but creative involvement from lots of people. When Tata wanted to make a $2,000 car, literally hundreds of suppliers had to rethink everything from the crankshaft to the dashboard to you know, the way the, the bonnet worked and uh, all the other suppliers needed to be aware of what each one did. So it's a very interesting model. Leader's job is to make sure everyone stays on the same version of the blueprint. Uh, captain and sports team, um, no, no uh, top-down direction, but people have been practicing a set group of plays, and they know how to react in an agile way depending on what's going on in the field. We see this a lot when, for example, uh, Red Adair puts out fires and caps oil fields, things can go wrong, and so his team needs to know how to adapt really quickly. London cabbies uh, are part of this model, or the double wall, as I mentioned before, um, SEAL Team 6, uh, and uh, uh, many of the elite military groups will function in this mode. So it's highly reactive, very low hierarchy, common language, uh, and the leader is on the field with the team. It's not someone behind a bench somewhere. They're, they're all on the field working together. Last model is uh, what we call senator and citizens, and it's basically a participatory democracy. So here the followers are citizens. They are informed, engaged citizens that are shaping their own world. There's no top-down strategy, and there's no micromanagement in terms of tasks. People are deciding where to go. And so you have fluid structures, you've got high degrees of engagement, but of course you need a very literate, informed, and engaged citizenry to make it work. A company like Gore, is an interesting one. The workplace actually elects the CEO. Like literally, the employees vote for who their CEO should be. They set their own performance uh, management uh, processes and hurdles. They, they in, in make their own investment decisions and they run it like a democratic institution, a pure democratic institution. So if you look at these examples, these eight archetypes, suddenly we have a, a more granular lens uh, to look at the world. We can look at it in a little bit more high definition and we can look at specific examples and see uh, what we can learn. And we get these three questions for leaders, which is how, you know, if you look at your results, 
if people didn't feel like they belong, what can you do to make them feel like they belong? If they haven't made a commitment, how do you convince them that they matter so that more of them are willing to become you know, that committed group? And how do you make sure that they end up working the same way? How do you work to make sure they have the same model in their head about how to work together? And so we've designed a bit of a diagnostic to make that happen. And uh, this is something Deloitte does in the marketplace. But I just want to show you an example of what this looks like. <clears throat> and this is more to demonstrate that you can actually take specific examples of trying to get uh, work to happen in the field and uh, help leaders be more effective at it. So this is a survey that was done uh, with the Center for Social Impact at UNSW with Peter Shergold. Uh, and what we were looking at was uh, 291 of the top uh, civil servants in Australia. So these are people who run federal departments, federal agencies, or state departments, state agencies, or are CEOs of nonprofits. And what we were measuring first was their sense of shared identity. And so what you can see here is that they have a high identity uh, or more strongly identify with the general public and their own agency than they do with the public sector. And so it's one of the challenges in the public sector if we're trying to get people to work across silos, across ministries, uh, they don't actually identify as much with a one public sector view. And so that's a, a, a burden that we have. Interestingly, we can actually compare respondents. And what I'm going to do is just... Um, compare the sectors people came from. And what you see here is interesting. The, the green line is the nonprofit sector. And one of the things you notice is that they identify very strongly with their own agency, right? See up there? In fact, it's one of the strongest identities that we saw. And they don't identify very strongly with the nonprofit, with the, the public sector. And so if one of the things you're trying to do is get nonprofit agencies and the public sector to work together, we have a problem. Because the nonprofit folks, maybe they have a disdain for the public sector, but they certainly don't identify with the public sector, and they have a very strong allegiance for their own agency. So something to be aware of. We can also test for you know, the degree to which people have made a commitment. So we can take specific propositions, like, for example, whether uh, nonprofit agencies should play a bigger role in delivery. And uh, we can see that you know, we've got 43% committed and 45% undecided. So we know if we want this to happen, we're not quite at critical mass. What's even more interesting is if we sort it a little bit, let's look at the nonprofit sector here. And you know we had almost 70% of them were committed to that. The interesting thing is if we instead looked at the state and Commonwealth folks, it's a bit of a different story. We have more than half of them undecided, only a third of them believing that that's a good idea. And so we know that this is not going to happen at this stage unless we manage to convince people that this is uh, more of an idea, interesting idea. By the way, the other thing we can do is actually say, well, I wonder where these people are actually from. Um, so if we look at these undecideds, let's go into a little bit more detail. Uh, they're disproportionately from ACT. And so it gives us a sense of where we need to do the work. So what I'm trying to show you here is that you can actually be quite deliberate about it. And now going to the archetypes, one of the interesting things is we can actually use the language of the archetypes to get a sense of what it might take to bring these people together. So if you look here, the dominant group uh, in terms of mental model was architect and builders. So that means that the, the people are saying, typically the way things work for us is that the minister has the big idea the vision. It's almost, almost unattainable, usually. And then it's up to all of us to figure out how to make this thing actually happen. Right? That's uh, the reality of life for most of them. That's the way they see it. And so if you want to make this thing work, how do you get more people to say yes? If their view of the world is architect and builder, you have to have a goal that is something that's inspiring. And the other thing that an architect does when uh, he or she is signing up builders is you have to make each of the builders recognize that they have a unique and amazing contribution to make. You know, you are the best electrical engineer, and this project will not work unless you make your contribution. They're not as motivated by financial incentives. They're motivated by a sense of being special and belonging. So 
If you just take what I've gone through very quickly is to demonstrate to you that you can take the principles I've been talking about, we can take any group, we can start to apply these ideas and help the leader be more successful in doing the things you need to bring people together to be more effective in terms of working as one. And just to go back to this, um, we set up a center for collective leadership. I mean, Jim, uh, my co-author, co Jim, who's the CEO of Deloitte, I'm not with Deloitte myself, but Jim set up a center for collective leadership to take this work further. And uh, that uh, has resulted in a website called asone.org. All the research is on that website for free. There's also a little classifier if you want to test out uh, whether your situation is one archetype or another or pass it around your work group. There's also a free iPhone and iPad apps with the classifier on them. Uh, so you can pick up the language and have the detail of the archetypes, but also be able to put them into use. You don't have to buy the book. So uh, let me stop there, and uh, hopefully we'll be able to have a good discussion around how to apply this thinking. Thanks. So we're going to open up the floor for questions, probably for about... Um, 15 minutes, um, and maybe if there's some, it's a bit hard to see the audience from here, there's a little bit of more light in the audience. Yes, I have a question. Um, as one, this is uh, actually the executive role of the Asian Research Hang on a minute, can we just get a microphone so everybody can hear that question? If you could just repeat it again with the microphone. Thank you. Thank you. Um, as one is about um, getting people to work together. And uh, my question is, uh, has there been research on what that does to the happiness of people? It's a fantastic question. Um, the answer is, there isn't specific research that I found that links the two, but I have uh, anecdotal observations. So as you go through all the different types of organizations I described, one of the things you notice is that there's less disharmony, there's less friction. Uh, if people have a similar archetype in their head about how they're supposed to work together, it means that, you know, life is a bit easier. And I think some of the things that would lead to people becoming unhappy because of their work environment or their, you know, social, I think those things go away. Whether or not this addresses deeper issues that lead to happiness or unhappiness, I don't know. Up here. Have you taken into consideration perhaps um, the selfish desires or the desires of the individual as opposed to one big working group? You've got to look at it from an individual perspective as well. So say someone that wants to, um, I don't know, have their own individual um, profit from that and other people who are working to profit the entire group as a collaboration? Yeah, so uh, it's a great question. Um, the archetypes don't assume that people are doing the collaboration for you know, philanthropic or uh, altruistic reasons. In fact, if you look at some of the archetypes, they're um, pretty much heavily based on financial incentives. So most of the examples of conductor and orchestra uh, and general and soldier, there's, you know, there's a sense that financial incentives matter more. If you look at landlord and tenant examples, they tend to be uh, heavily based on the way economics and financials work for the individual. Uh, and the thing is, though, that people who work in those archetypes have a philosophical agreement about whether the rules that govern that game are fair. So in other words, the developers that go into Apple's game of developing apps are buying into the basic fairness that the market should decide whether or not they get money. So it doesn't matter how much effort you put in, it's people will vote with their iPhones, and if Angry Birds works, it's fair for you to make a lot of money. That's the way people view it. So uh, that's not necessarily the case with conductor and orchestra. It's not a, as much about a market-based thing. It is based on um, performance, and you know, there are positive and negative thresholds and incentives linked to that. But uh, the, the idea here is that people have different things that motivate them. Uh, if you look at producer creative team, oftentimes it's the thrill of being involved in the creative process. Uh, outweighs a, a financial incentive. Uh, and uh, uh, so it, it, the model's taking the, the different psychology of individuals into account. 
Just the lady in front of the previous question. Oh, just up there, sorry. I was just wondering if you'd taken into account cultural differences. Some cultures are, are col more collective um, naturally and some are more individual. A lot of the examples are probably more from Western society apart from your double wellers, which I understand are more a collective society and that's perhaps why it's effect they work so well together. That's a great question. Um, so actually we try to pick our example set um, so that we had good representation from all over the world. And so there's quite a few actually Asian examples in the mix, uh, African examples and so on. In fact, we even have one example which is fictional. It's the, the Borg, which are a Star Trek, a fictional <laughs> Star Trek, but so the Delta Quadrant is also covered. Um, but um, in applying the work to different cultures, we are seeing patterns pop up. So for example, and, and it's still early days, we haven't done as many diagnostics for me to feel that this is you know, completely settled. Uh, but directionally, what we're beginning to see is, as you would expect in Japan, a higher proportion or a, a shift to uh, the left, you know, and up, so more uh, uh, command and control or conductor and orchestra, you see. Uh, Australia, the dominant form that's popped up so far is architect and builders. We seem to be uh, a society that likes people to have a vision, but then to give people freedom within a frame to participate in it. Uh, there are also some interesting other observations that are popping up, is when you look at this demographically, uh, what we're beginning to see on the first two dimensions, if I'm looking at the sense of belonging and whether or not people are committing, uh, what we're finding in most organizations is women uh, are showing up with a significant lower either identity, common identity, or uh, directional intensity. And uh, the research, uh, pe some people would have hypothesized that they should have been higher because they feel women have a higher uh, affinity uh, ability. Uh, but what it says in terms of our current organizations, at least the set we've done so far, <clears throat> in general they have not been able to engage women uh, and uh, get the most out of them. The, and as a result, their sense of belonging and their desire to commit to act is lower than, than for men. Perhaps that needs a leadership change. Yeah. <laughs> the question here. Thanks. Uh, I'm wondering if you're aware of um, online movements like uh, crowdfunding and crowdsourcing. How do you see them? Where do they fit into this structure? Um, they fit into uh, the bottom three archetypes generally. And you can have examples of all of them. Uh, if you take an organization like Patients Like Me, which is, a, I think, a fabulous organization. This is basically people who are uh, s basically suffering from very specific uh, diseases, but diseases that are low incidence in local populations. So in Brisbane, there might be two people with that condition, for example. But if you look at them as a global group, there's a sufficient critical mass for them to get together. Well, Patients Like Me has brought them together, and they talk about their condition, they give each other tips, and they even uh, are able to create clinical trials. Uh, that's very much a senator and citizen model. And so many of the examples of internet-based communities end up being senator and citizen. Uh, the other place you see them is sometimes what we call community organizer and volunteer, get up, uh, or organizations, avaz, people, people who try to get grassroots movements um, are community organizer and volunteers, as you'd expect. Uh, and then the last place we see them is some of the ones that are incredibly effective and agile and able to coordinate activities like flash mobs, uh, or uh, you know, activities that go from just being on the internet with some kind of physical uh, manifestation often go into captain and sports team. And they basically use SMS and uh, Twitter and these other things to, to happen. Uh, if you, just to give you an interesting example, I mentioned Egypt before. Uh, you know, one of the questions would be, uh, even you look at Tunisia, what happened there. Who was the leader of what happened in Tunisia? There was no leader, right? I mean, you could argue about the person who set himself on fire, started it, but there was no leader. And so those are, those types of, you know, grassroots movements and explosions, those are, tend to be either community organizer, volunteer, or captain and sports team. Uh, and what happens over time is they, they live out, so Egypt has gone from, you know, an amazing experience as a community organizer, volunteer movement to now general and soldiers. We'll see where it lands ultimately. I guess it's the technology allowing people to engage and that's flowing on to the different models. Yeah, I mean, technology plays a really important part in actually the transitions that we're seeing. I think, 
you know, general and soldiers does not require technology in the same way because you've got a one, uh, you know, the flow of information is up and down. You can control that. Uh, if you look at some of the models that allow much more network, real-time behavior, they wouldn't have been as easy to make happen without the technology that we enjoy today. So I think that actually technology is one of the accelerants of a shift in terms of the way people work together. Down at the front here. I will get up to the back, I can see. Um, evidently, you're putting this together as a, uh, an interest and, and a research tool, but you've got Deloitte working with you. Are they utilizing this to, uh, I guess you'd be utilizing it to assess organizations, but also in the consulting world to try and sort of shape how organizations communicate with themselves? Are they seeing results with that? Have they started doing this? Yes, yeah, so there are, uh, so Deloitte is taking it to market in the corporate world and the government world. But there's also a lot of pro bono activity. So let me tell you about two things. I mean, they've done it with schools, high schools. And it's been very interesting to uh, take the results. So that the challenge to two high schools was, how do you turn the high school into a more unified community? Very interesting kind of thing to look at. And um, the schools were very different. One was a highly selective um, academic school uh, with, I'd say, over 95% Asian population. And another school was non-selective, a very mixed demographic. If you look at the second school, uh, identity was a more, more of an issue. You know, we've got this ethnic mix, what happens? And what we were able to see is, for example, the Middle East and the Indian population in that school had actually very high sense of identity with the school and the class and their peer group, even higher than the average. Uh, but the Korean population was lower. Uh, or there was one specific group in that school that showed uh, a real um, disengagement in terms of identity and directional intensity with the school. It was boys, white boys in year 10. So what was interesting is you, know, you could take that, so that community and you can actually identify what's going on. Or, or we also looked at faculty. You know, the degree of harmony, for example, in the math faculty was different than PE, than history. And so the interesting thing about all this work is it's one thing to measure, but by measuring it, you're introducing a fact set for a group of people that lets them act intelligently on it. So with that school community, the idea was, okay, here are the facts. What do you want to do about it? Uh, in the other school, 15% of the population said that they had been bullied at some point. And if you look at what happens to the, affili the affiliation and the commitment levels of those who'd been bullied, it dropped significantly. So the question is, what do you want to do about it? Are you comfortable with 15% of your school population being bullied or experiencing your school that way? If not, what do you want to do about it? You know, are you waiting for the principal to issue an edict or students, do you want to act to make a difference? So part of what happens with this tool is the facts of the case hold up a mirror to a group of people and then it allows them to have a real conversation about whether or not they want to make change. The examples in the corporate world are similar. There's um, one company that's now in its third year of looking at this data. There's another company that's going into its second year. And what happens in each of those cases is, you know, people's lights uh, go on because they suddenly realize, well, that explains that. You know, so the facts suddenly draw um, connections and, and people be, have a way of explaining things that have been going on. Uh, and then that, as a result, they can act on it. Uh, one of the other things that it does for leaders is um, if you're a leader of a very large organization, instead of trying to act on everything yourself, you can allow your top 100, for example, to look at the data for their own group and act in a way that makes sense for their own group. And so essentially what starts happening is that you have a, a transformation within organizations where people begin to take responsibility for, as leaders, for making people feel like they belong, for making them realize that what they do actually matters, and beginning to create a, a, a common set of ideas about how to work together, which hopefully leads to the happiness you were seeking. Over here. Hey, um, I'm taking it from a kind of a micro, uh, micro or macro level, and one of the results you showed before about the public sector and comparing the not-for-profit and government and whatnot. I'm interested in how do you get the not-for-profits to identify as part of the public sector and so hopefully in that process start to collaborate better? How do you do that? <laughs> <laughs> it's a, so it's a great question. Uh, the answer is going to be very specific. So you have to take a very specific case and work through, you know, to see if you can create something that is a common identity. I mean, the example I give to people a lot is, you know, 
people will have their favorite uh, NRL club, and they barrack for them really, really hard. But then if you get into an argument about NRL versus you know, Aussie rules or rugby union, they're all going to be NRL fans first. So, so somehow they switch to a higher allegiance. It's pretty much the same thing, is that uh, if you want to get a group of people who have positioned themselves as different camps within a group, you have to find something that becomes a greater unifying theme that they both identify with. And um, without being cheesy, it's actually amazing how physical tokens can create that sense of identity. I mean, you, I'm amazed at what impact little you know, colored bracelets have uh, in terms, but you know, we're tribal in that sense. And things that people do that allow them to see themselves as part of that one, even if it's for one activity, those are the kinds of things that cross the bridge you're, you're talking about. Any further questions? I saw a few hands right at the top there, a bit of a run. community of practice kinds of ways of leading, but you're still suggesting that um, the lone genius has the vision at the top, um, and that's that idea of leadership as a property of individuals. What about that notion of relational leadership, of leadership as, as something that comes out of relationships? Yeah. Um, and why I'm saying this is because of the research that's talking about how with um, it, people being so educated now, employees, and the yeah. complex problems that we face, like sustainability, the idea that the, the CEO will have the answer is yeah. maybe a bit simplistic. Oh, in absolutely. Yeah. So three of, the five ar three of the eight archetypes do not have a top-down idea of leadership at all. So if you look at senator and citizens, for example, the senators are public, you know, they're, they're servant leaders. And they're not seen to be it's sort of the Roman definition of senator. But it, the idea is that they are uh, part of the public. They represent the public. But you know, the idea is that the citizenry vote. They are engaged. They make decisions and so on. So Gore, the example I was giving as a company, literally, I mean, the CEO is elected by the employees. And the employees have self-managed teams. And our company in Brazil called Semco is very similar, where people are highly engaged. And no one would accuse them of having a top-down leader. If you look at community organizers and volunteers, I, I think community organizers have such a, a valiantly brave life for taking on the challenges they do because they have no formal authority. Uh, they have influence, and their influence depends on their ability to create the narratives that attract people to do things. Again, it's not top-down in any way. And the captain and sports team, you know, we didn't call it coach and sports team or team owner and sports team. We called it captain because it's almost a first among equals uh, kind of idea. So I think, in fact, you're pointing out um, what one of the reasons why I think the first dimension the analysis uh, pointed out as being important is power. And that, you know, that, that whole power dimension, whether the leader has power or not, uh, ends up being one of the biggest determinants of the different archetypes. And at least three of them, the leader doesn't have much power. I think we've got time for one last question just up the top there. Um, hi, I was interested in um, what you were saying about community organisers finding it a lot easier to uh, garner energy around a, f a concept of an enemy or something yeah. negative. That is not how I want to run a community organisation yeah. that I'm in. And so I'm thinking, well, so what you're saying is if I have just simply a positive yeah. call for action, it's going to be half as effective. <laughs> Can you comment on that? Yeah, no. So what I was pointing out is you know, something that we see a lot. I mean, it's a lot easier to uh, be in opposition than to be in government. It's a lot easier to get people, uh, if you look at the United States, for example, it's so easy to get people to be against uh, a whole bunch of things, from government funding to you know, where the, whether the president was actually born in the US and things like that. But uh, when it comes, if you were to actually then go from being that voice of the Tea Party to being in power, I think they would find it quite challenging. So what I'm trying to say is that I think people have used the negative as an easy way of organizing. I think the challenge we have as humanity is that that has to end. Because ultimately, uh, uniting people against the, an enemy, if it's, you know, if it's part of the human race, uh, ends up being counterproductive. Uh, I think it's fine if the enemy is a natural disaster, for example. And you can see what happens when there's a flood 
There's an, you know, and the, the ability of the Japanese people to respond to what they've experienced in an orderly way is amazing to me. And, and so I think it, it brings out the best in most people when you have that situation. The challenge I think we have as community organizers, as leaders, and, and I spend a lot of time with you know, 15, 16 year olds who have to be trained that leadership is not being a general, it's being a community organizer in their setting because they're never gonna be able to tell their peers what to do. Uh, and part of, the, part of the challenge is getting them to understand that it, the power of the narrative is most important. And if you, if you can create a very powerful, positive narrative, it can have impact. Um, one of the examples I love is um, the students at Sydney Boys High School. So this is a, a very, um, let me call it a testosterone high school. <laughs> uh, and these boys decided in year 10, as part of the high results program, to do uh, a project on gender equality. And Sydney Boys would pretty much be the last place I would have picked to do a project on gender equality. But they did the research and they created a presentation which uh, explained why they thought gender equality was important for boys to do. And my wife calls it the boy effect on the girl effect. But it's that, you know, why it was important for them to be vocal on this issue. And they've made that presentation now to lots of different high schools, corporate settings, and somehow it's incredibly effective coming from a 15-year-old boy uh, in a way that is not from a 35-year-old woman, for example. And they've had a lot of success with that. So what I think community organizers have to do is find ways of being able to tell stories in emotive, powerful ways with um, storytellers who have legitimacy, uh, um, authenticity, and that they can move people. In fact, I believe the future of our planet rests on our ability to do that. I'd like to wrap up the session. I'd really like to thank, thank you for that wonderful session today and also all of the work not only the as one that you do in your corporate work and your pro bono work and your social enterprise in giving us a greater understanding and the tools to understand what we what we want to do in terms of making social change Thank you and I'd like much. us to put our hands together Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.